Hey guys, welcome back. So today we want to talk about a rifle manufactured by Century Arms right here in the United States using a parts kit and it's called the Galani and it's a US made copy of the Israeli Galil rifle. But first, before we get into that rifle, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Galil rifle. And in front of me is a M62, which is also known as the RK62, which was a Finnish military service rifle. And this is a very early example of that gun. And that can be uh, identified easily by the cheese grater hand guards and the bicycle tube pistol grip. So this is a very, very early rifle. And this one is chambered in 762 by 39. And the reason why I'm showing you this rifle is because the Israelis, when they went to develop the Galil domestically, they leaned pretty heavily on the design of this rifle, and some say they would directly copy it, and when you see the, the similarities between the two, I think you're going to agree, so much so that it's been said, and I can't verify this is the truth, that early Galils actually used RK-62 uh, receivers, but there are some differences in the RK-62 receivers. But I've never seen any pictures of Galils with an RK-62 receiver, but again, that's what's been said. So let's take a real quick look at this rifle, and then we'll get over into the Galil and the Galani. But I thought it was important, again, to talk a little bit about the history of where the Galil's design came from. Now, taking a look at this, some may even confuse it for a Galil, because there's a lot of similarities there. Now, of course, the stock, completely different. This stock does not fold. It's a fixed steel tube with a rubber sleeve over it, uh, this rather awkward looking pistol grip that looks like a bicycle tire or something. Uh, but when you get into the similarities, of course, the receivers look very similar. This is a machined receiver like the Galil. You'll notice the rear sight. So this is where we start getting into uh, where the Israelis were really starting to, to borrow heavily from this rifle, the receiver and this rear sight, which is attached to a stamped sheet metal top cover that goes back to zero when you take the gun apart and put it back together again. But this sight's a little bit different. If you take a look really closely, you'll see that you can make elevation adjustments to the rear peep here. And that's done by loosening a screw and then sliding this up and down. You have standard AK type range adjustments by slider. Here you have a screw with a slot in it that you can adjust up and down. And that's because when you flip this rear sight over, it has night sights. Now these night sights have long since expired but that's where they would be on the rear sight. The Galil has them in a different position. They work slightly differently. But when you flip this back, the sight back over, it has protective ears trying to protect that rear aperture sight. So that's pretty unique, but conceptually it's very similar to what the Israelis adopted. Moving forward, you're gonna see a very similar gas tube, uh, the top cover gas tube. All this looks like it's uh, very, very, like almost interchangeable with the Galil. We get to the front sight block. The front sight block is only adjustable for windage and it's very much like what the Galil uses. And it's similar to the FAL in terms of how you make adjustments to windage. You loosen one screw and tighten the other. And then you would just slide that sight left and right. It has a simple front post pin. And then just like the Galil, it has a flip up night sight, which again is, is expired. So when you had the, the gun in the night firing configuration, you'd flip your rear sight forward like that, flip that up, and then you would have tritium front and rear, and you could adjust the elevation again with that screw in the rear. So very interesting rifle, and, and quite ahead of its time for 1962 when it was adopted. So this is a product improved AK-47. The Finns took a look at the AK. They said we could do something better, and in my opinion, they definitely did. This is a very robust weapon system. Okay, so this is a magazine. This is an original. You can see that little, uh, there's a little, hook right there, if you will, on the bottom. And that's kind of unique to these magazines. Otherwise, it looks pretty much like a, any other AK magazine. And again, it does chamber 762 by 39. This is some Wolf ammunition. When you lock the magazine into place, you'll notice you have this long protective sheet metal cover, cover coming down here. And then it's kind of bumped out on the right for the index finger. So you can knock the magazine out. Definitely favors a right-handed shooter. Standard AK fire controls. And most notably, it does not have a selector lever over here by the thumb on the Galil, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But yeah, so again, very much similar to the rifle that copies it, the Galil. So let's do a little bit of shooting with this rifle. Then we'll take a look at the Galil and the Galani. And just like the AK before it, it does not lock open or last shot fired. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the M62 or RK62. 
All right, let's move on and check out the Galani and the Galil. We would like to thank our friends at Big Daddy Unlimited for helping to make this and other videos possible. If you'd like to help us out, swing by the BDU website, and just for 99 cents, you can try out their service for one month. And they're basically like the Sam's Club of the online world, so check them out. If you would like to stay a member, go by militaryarms.org. There's a big link right at the top of the website, and you can stay a member for 20% off every month going forward. So please check them out. So this is the Galil ARM. You've seen this particular rifle here on the channel before. I do have an AR, which has just the black polymer front hand guards, no bipod. These rifles were made in a number of different configurations. They were imported in several different configurations for civilian semi-automatic only sales. This one has an 18 inch barrel. Uh, some of them, the SARs would come in with 16 inch barrels towards the end of the run and I'm not gonna get into all the different variations. But this would be representative of a infantry rifle used for a very short time by the IDF. But this rifle has a lot of similarities. Take a look at that receiver, it has the same profile to it. And uh, it's a machined receiver, just like the RK62. But where it differs is this one has a FAL style folding stock. So you just kind of pull down on it and fold it to the side. It's a very robust stock, very durable. You'll notice that obviously, not only based heavily on the RK62, but also on the AK-47. So let's talk about some of the differences. Take a look at this rear sight. So you can see it's, again, a stamped sheet metal top cover that goes back to zero, has a much smaller sight block back here. You have an aperture that has a detent for three different positions. So you have range differences here on these apertures, and then you have a flip up night sight, and you can put this in the half mass position uh, but it'll still work even with the apertures flipped up. The tritium would be on the side, but the tritium, again, has long since expired, being the half-life on the tritium is about 10 years. Uh, these rifles are much older than that. So that's different, where the RK-62 flipped forward. This one has a very simple little flip-up leaf right here. Moving forward, we have pretty much the identical gas tube on here. This one does have a carrying handle, but the AR would not have that. And then if you move up here to the front sight block, this one just like the RK-62 is adjustable for windage. So you have a screw that you can tighten and loosen, move it left and right. But this one is also adjustable for elevation. So when you zero the rifle, you're doing it with the front sight. And you have a hole here in the top for a tool. And then on the bottom, just like the RK-62, you have a flip up tritium night sight. So a lot of similarities there. Now this one has an 18 inch barrel, like I said, it has the folding bipod that will fold into the hand guards and stow. And one of the other big differences is this upturned charging handle. This is very characteristic of the Galil, and that's so you can actually work the action of the gun over the top of the receiver versus having to roll the gun or break your grip and charge the weapon. So very similar, but somewhat different. Now, when we take the gun apart, the RK-62 is a little bit different. You'll notice here on the, the little uh, pin that's on the back of the recoil spring and guide rod, you'll notice that this tail that comes out is much longer. So when you push that all the way in, you pry up, and that top cover comes off. Now, just like the RK-62, you have a reinforced rear sheet metal top cover here that you're not gonna find on your average AK, and that's gonna help it recenter itself to go back to zero when you put it back together, and it sets in this deep cut slot back here. On the inside, you can see where they've welded the sight to the, uh, to the top cover. And it's just standard, like one mil thickness. I can flex it with my fingers, uh, sheet metal. Inside, standard AK type uh, recoil spring guide rod. Pull the bolt to the rear. You'll notice it has that little star, which this is also present on the RK62. And then your standard bolt and everything. Of course, this is 5.56 where the RK-62 is 762 by 39. Just like the Finn rifle, the gas tube just pulls off, there's no lever. And that's pretty much the rifle field stripped. Has AK type fire controls, but where this rifle has another important change is while we still have AK controls over here on the side, we also have now a safe and fire selector with the thumb right here, which is actually quite handy and ingenious. So pull it back for safe, push it forward for fire. You'll notice it has that, this is copied directly again from the Finn rifle, it comes all the way down and it bumps out on the right so it's very easy for the fire with the right-handed shooter to bump that magazine, knock it out of the gun. 
So let's put her back together really quick. So it's a little bit easier to reassemble than an AK because you don't have to use your bolt carrier to turn a lever up to get your gas tube off. It's a little trick here I've mentioned before in video that when I was in Israel, I showed one of the IDF shoulders. They're like, we didn't know you could do that. So because it has this longer tail on it, if you take the recoil spring guide rod and just kind of balance it there where it's kind of forward and it's setting on the receiver in and down, when you put your top cover on, just set it down, push it down into its slots, and then just simply pull the charging handle to the rear, and that pops that long tail out. Makes it much easier to put the gun back together. All right, so the sights and everything are very similar. Let's do a little bit of shooting with the actual Galil ARM, and then let's take a look at that Galani. And just like an AK, does not lock open on the last shot fired. Magazines drop out very easily. And notice how I can put the weapon on safe with the thumb fire control on the pistol grip. All right, now let's take a look at that Galani and see how close Century Arms got it. All right, guys, so here is the Galani. Now, this rifle, uh, it's kind of hard to get a, a, a beginning manufacturing date. So we know that the owner's manual is dated 2007. We know that there was a recall on the rifle in 2007. Uh, because of a firing pin change, they wanted to put a spring on the firing pin. I suspect they were having slam firing problems. But this is made from an actual IMI parts kit from an old machine gun that uh, Century Arms had gotten their hands on. Then they outsourced a receiver. We don't know who actually made the receiver for sure. Uh, it doesn't have that manufacturer's marking on it. All it has is Century Arms markings on it. The, the, the serial number on this one starts with GAL, almost like Galil, but it's Galani instead. So. This rifle, as you can see, is very, very similar to the actual Galil rifle that I have over here. This one has an 18-inch barrel. As I said, they'd also imported some towards the end there with 16-inch barrels. This one has a 17-and-a-half-inch-ish barrel as we measured it, so it's very close to the, uh, the same length as the actual ARM that we have here. And it seems like the parts kit that they used, they refinished it nicely. It has a nice even park. Now you'll notice on the Galil, they used a, a like an enamel type paint, something like an HK style paint. On the Galani, you have that, uh, that parkerization finish, but you'll also notice that the finish on the original Galil stock here is similar to on the Galani. So they didn't re refinish the stocks as they put them in there. The sights, everything are the same. I don't believe the tritium ever worked on the Galanis. Now, one thing you're gonna notice right away with this particular rifle, look at the size of the front hood. This one has an R4, which is a South African rifle manufactured under license. This big, large hood is off an R4. The original Galil had the smaller style uh, front sight hood. Now, this is a used rifle. It came into Copper Custom. So that's why we're doing the video. So this rifle has had some changes to it. This is a Midwest Industries rail system on it. And that's not something that it originally shipped with. It would have shipped with uh, you know, standard Galil furniture uh, from the parts kit. Now, if you take a look at the pistol grip, this is probably a US manufactured part for 922R compliance because it, the, the sheen and everything looks a little bit different than what you would see on the actual Galil. But everything else seems to uh, you know, be a really, really good copy. And really, again, guys, we're talking about original top cover, original bolt and carry, original gas tube, original, um, you know, uh, barrel length. The muzzle device looks, if it's a US made part, they did a pretty good job copying it. The gas block is slightly different on it. Um, but yeah, so the US parts, I believe, has a TAPCO trigger in it and a US made receiver and it uses standard, it shipped with, I believe, just standard Galil magazines. So how they got to the, the 922R parts count, I, I couldn't tell you for absolute certainty. So in reading some articles on the Galani, we noticed that, you know, 
uh, you'd have varying levels of quality, and this goes back to anything that Century Arms manufactures here in the United States, especially from parts kits. You'll have people that'll have you know, different problems with the gun. One of the things that seems to be a common theme based upon a Tactical Life article we read back from 2009 is that it seems like a lot of the rifles would have to have that front sight drifted to the right to get it zeroed, and this rifle's no different. To get it zeroed, that front sight had to be drifted to the right, but it is zeroable. So, uh, but that seems to be a common theme. I don't know if the threads are cockeyed in the receiver or what, but uh, they mentioned that in the article. They also mentioned that the, uh, the top cover, sometimes people had to literally knock them on with rubber mallets. Uh, this one doesn't seem to have those issues, but let's get into that. So I, I wanted to show you next to the original Galil, and then we're gonna do some shooting here with the Galani, take it apart and see what it looks like on the inside. So Jason is making me do this. He wants to know if I can 80s hip fire and bump fire this gun. I've never tried it before. And uh, uh, sticky magazine with 35 rounds. Let's see what we got. One hiccup, first try, not bad. I think it works. <laughs> Now this gun again is built from a parts kit and um, you know everything from the buttstock, top cover, uh, bolt, carrier, gas tube, all that stuff looks like it's right off an IMI made parts kit with the exception of the possible South Af African R4 uh, front sight hood there. So there's really not much to talk about when the only real component that Century worked with here that isn't surplus uh, aside from the pistol grip and whatever 922R parts that they use, like the trigger group, which is a TAPCO, is this receiver. We don't know who made the receiver, but it, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good clone of the receiver. The really big difference that we see uh, is this, this cutout area here, and then this hole is much larger than uh, the hole for the Galil, which is just a pivot hole for the selector lever. This one's much larger, and it may have something to do with them getting the TAPCO trigger to work with this safety fire control unit on the left-hand side of the receiver. Not sure, but that's like the biggest differences. If you look at the contours, the cuts, everything, it looks really, really good. It's a very close facsimile of the original Galil receiver. Midwest Industries hand guards did not ship with the gun. Probably would have had some sort of a surplus uh, parts, or, you know, hand guard set up here. The barrel on this thing is US made. I believe it has a one in nine twist from what we can tell. It's not marked on the barrel, but reading some articles on it and it's not chrome lined. So this gun has had mixed reviews. So if you look at the forum posts and you take a look at articles written like from Tactical Life and things like that, they talk about fitment issues, typical Century Arms stuff. Fitment issues, reliability issues. I think Nothing Fancy did a video and he had some problems with his Galani. Uh, so it just, it just runs the gambit. You just never know what you're going to get. It's like a box of chocolates when you buy something from Century Arms that they manufactured here in the United States. So let's take it apart. You know, we already talked about that it has a, just a standard straight up Galil stock that's pinned on here to the receiver. Taking it apart has a long tail. These are all parts. Now look how easily I can get that top cover off. Putting it on takes a little bit more effort, but that's not uncommon with Galils either. Here we have this port buffer, probably not something that originally shipped with the gun. The original owner likely put that on there, surplus. Recoil spring and guide rod. Take the bolt and carrier out. Now you'll notice that it has that same Galil style, you know, these, these extra, you know, fins, if you will, back here. So this tells me it most likely isn't a US made compliance part. That's right off the, the you know, original parts kit. And same thing with the, the bolt and the carrier. Parts kit parts, not US made. Now, even though the Midwest Wind Industries rail system is on here, you can still pull out the gas tube like you normally would. And then if you take a look on the inside of the receiver, it looks actually fairly well machined. Now you can see that TAPCO trigger sitting in there and you can see how the selector lever works. Popped it past its detent there. And so the gun seems to shoot pretty good. Now we already mentioned that we had to drift that front sight all the way over to the right. Based on articles we've read, that's not uncommon with these rifles. So putting the gun back together is just like the RK62 or the Galil because it is a Galil clone. Slide that in there, take your bolt and carrier. I kind of twist it this way because that little star pattern back here kind of makes it difficult. It wants to ram, but uh, sometimes I'll twist it, drop that bolt in, push it forward, 
take your recoil spring and guide rod, and I use the exact same trick on this as I do the Galil, just kind of perch it there on the receiver, take the top cover, set it in there, and this is where Tactical Life said some users have to use rubber mallets. I can get away with just hitting it with the palm of my hand. It's fully seated there, and she's back together. All right, so let's see. Let's go ahead and shoot. Oh yeah, by the way, this is the other thing that's kind of important. So I don't know why the Israelis could do it, but Arsenal struggles with this and Century couldn't come up with a solution. Back is fire on the Galani and forward is safe, which is the exact opposite of the Galil. So to fire the gun, you have to pull it back, which is an unnatural motion. So on the Galil, you'll notice the weapon is on fire. Uh, if I want to put it on fire with the Galil, I push it forward. But on this gun, it puts it on safe. So now I have to make this unnatural motion of sweeping my thumb back or just go ahead and do the AK swipe, take the safety off. All right. All right, drop the mag, see it drops out, uh, drops out just as easily as it does on the actual Galil, and it feels about as smooth. Now you'll notice there's a little bit of a fitment issue there that I haven't seen on my other Galils, a little bit of a gap there, but again, minor stuff, nitpicky stuff. Keep in mind, guys, when this gun was originally on the market, this thing sold for 550 bucks, maybe 600 bucks. Now, if you take a look on Gun Broker right now, you'll see guns out there, at least when we look today, that are at 950 bucks and still have days to go on it and you know have like 12 bids. So these guns are gonna bring more than $1,000. So they've already doubled in value since they, they uh, stopped producing them. Now, like I said, the, the owner's manual that we have uh, is dated 2007. We know there was a recall in 2007 for the firing pin that they replaced, put a spring in there to keep it from slam firing most likely. And then we've seen articles in 2009. So I'm not sure when Century Arms ran out of parts and stopped production of the guns. So if you're looking for a gun that uh, you want to shoot a Galil and you don't want to pay the exorbitant prices for an actual real Galil on some place like Gun Broker, and I have no idea what they're worth anymore, my guns I've owned for many years, uh, this, is, this is still a, a viable option. Just keep in mind, when you're buying anything Century Arms related, especially older production guns, I, don't, I can't speak to the new stuff. They're claiming that they've, they've improved their quality assurance. Uh, it's, it's, it's a box of chocolates, guys, as Forrest Gump would say, because you just don't know what you're gonna get. You may get a gun that somebody's trying to dump because it's unreliable, you can't be zeroed, parts don't fit, you gotta like use tools to get it together and you know take it apart. You just never know. So I wanted to dig in a little bit more into the selector lever being reversed on the Galani versus the Galil, and I wanted to show you guys why. So if you take a look in here, this is just a standard Tapco trigger, AK trigger. Now, while the Galil uses an AK style trigger, it is not an actual AK trigger. And that's what it looks like Century Arms has put in here. And so if you take a look over here where I'm pointing with this tool, there's some parts missing, a little cam and things like that, okay? So when you flip this, you can see it's directly acting on the safety bar there. If you take a look at the Galil, Take a look right here. You'll see there's a different linkage and a different camming pin. So when I move that lever, it's reversing the control. And there you can see them side by side. This one has fire back here. This one has safe back here. So it would appear they didn't put too much effort into making that AK trigger work just like a Galil. They felt that they could just get by with allowing those fire controls to be reversed and a little bit awkward. But still, again, you're looking at thousands of dollars for one of these, and even at today's prices, you're still looking at a thousand-ish dollars for a clone.
So this is an actual Galil magazine, one of my early pre-band mags. And it seems to be having a problem with it. I think these things shipped with Tapco mags. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. And this is just standard Wolf Gold Taiwanese ammo. We shoot it all the time. Never have any problems with it. So let's see if this magazine continues to have problems. But you can see this is practically a brand new magazine. Again, this is one of my pre-band mags. No Cosmoline or anything in this one. Seems like it's hanging up maybe just a little bit on this mag. Didn't pick one up. Locked in just as it should be. There it goes. Grabbed one that time. Another malfunction. So it may seem that this gun is actually fairly mag specific. Wow, it wasn't doing this, it just started this stuff. So we can get through the last few rounds here. All right. All right. That's interesting. So we thought with my other magazine, which is not a pre-band, but just a really good uh, surplus mag that had Cosmoline in it, that maybe the Cosmoline was causing it uh, not to get the roundup in time for the bolt to catch it. But as you can see on the, the follower of this magazine, it is not uh, caked in Cosmoline or anything else. This is a clean, very pristine, original Galil magazine. All right, so this is a surplus mag that the gun came with, along, I think, with a couple of Tapco magazines. Uh, this one's obviously well used, but we've loaded it to the full 35 round capacity. Uh, we've typically been using 10 or 20 rounds in our videos lately because of the shortage of ammunition. All right, so let's see if this gun will run 35 rounds out of the magazine it came with. It just may be a little bit ammo, or I'm sorry, magazine specific. A little tight there. All right, all 35 rounds with no issues. So it may just be a little bit magazine sensitive there. Now the magazine that I was showing you had a date code of 679 on it. And um, so that's a very early magazine, long before the import ban. And this one just has a six. I don't know if that's a Hebrew marking or what. But, um, you know, like I said, several company, uh, countries, not companies, countries had adopted this rifle so the magazines could have been made all over the place. So, um, you know, my Glills, I use junk surplus mags to anything that's actual military surplus, not the Tapco mags. And I've never had a problem with any of my Glills with the magazines, and certainly the magazines we have out here today, the guns run fine with. So it does seem like this particular gun, um, you may have to pick and choose which magazines you, you use in it, but Otherwise, it seems to work okay. One other thing I should point out about the Galani is the fact that, unlike the RK-62, uh, the Galil has this scope mount cut out on the left-hand side of the receiver. Now, I have an old mount that was made by B-Square. I don't have an original IMI mount, but uh, I don't have it here to test it. But it looks like it's cut. When I compare it to my actual Galil, it looks like the cuts are close enough to where if you actually had one of those extremely rare accessories, you would be able to use that scope mount. So again, the gun, I don't know, it works okay with the magazines it came with, the guy traded it in with, and these are old surplus mags. Didn't try it with the Tapco mags. I, I just don't like Tapco. 
um, but perhaps it works with them. But it had several of these, and it seems to like these okay. With my newer, fresher, cleaner Galil mags, eh, I didn't like them so much. But um, yeah, I mean, it just kind of is what it is. When you're looking at a gun now that's retailing for about a thousand bucks, if you want a Galil, it's about the only game in town unless you want to find one of the very scarce parse kits. Those are almost all gone now. And pick up a receiver and have a reputable builder put it together. This is going to be the only game in town. So you're going to have to roll the dice and hope you can get one that actually is serviceable and works. And if it's kind of sort of problematic, again, you're going to have to send it off to a competent gunsmith to clean it up and get it working for you. That or you're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a pre-ban, which, uh, yeah, most people I, I wouldn't recommend doing. They're neat, unless, they're, unless you're a collector, they're not that neat. Well, guys, that's it. If you have any questions about the Galani, uh, we'll answer whatever questions you, you have down in the comment section below. Might not have all the answers, but that's why we rely on some of our viewers. Our viewers have a wealth of knowledge, and we learn a lot from you guys uh, for sure. So post those comments down below. And if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, a great way to do that is to become a Patreon supporter. We're supported by you, our viewing audience. We're not supported by you know, gun manufacturers like Century Arms and things like that. We wanna bring you honest, unbiased information as humanly possible, and we can only do that through your support. So please consider supporting us over on Patreon. Conversely, if you want something a little bit easier to help support us, there's a little join button right underneath the video player you're watching right now on your desktop or mobile device. Give that join button a click, take a look at some of the perks, and consider supporting us right here on YouTube. And last but not least, guys, swing by and check out Copper Custom. All right, thanks for 12 years of support. Let's load up the last few rounds we have, and uh, hopefully we don't have any malfunctions. All right, ending on a positive note. Again, thanks for those 12 years of support, guys. We'll talk to you soon.